Okay, without further ado, Dr. Stephanie Lamb from coming to us from Phoenix, Arizona, talking to us about some veterinary topics. Oops, and I probably have to allow sharing for you. Just see. Oh, let me just see. There, I'll make you co-host there so you can share. All right, okay, great. Dr. Lamb. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I did make a PowerPoint for this. So we're gonna get that up here. And let's go from the beginning here. All right, so um, the first topic that I was gonna talk with you guys about today is about safety in our homes. Um, one of the common problems that I'll see birds coming into the office for at all the different places where I've worked have been trauma related things. I mean, we see birds for lots of different problems, but trauma is one of the things that's fairly common to come into the hospital. Um, and there's lots of different types of trauma that birds can endure. And so going through this talk, I'm going to talk about the common things that I've seen, and then maybe some of the less common things and things to maybe um, be aware of and, and look out for in our homes uh, to try to avoid a problem, because that's always what we want. It's always better to uh, prevent problems uh, than to have to deal with them. So uh, the things we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about injuries where it's been a bird versus another bird, um, a bird having trauma from other animals in the home um, or outside the home, uh, birds having trauma from people on accidents, uh, birds versus their cage or their toys or the, just household items and things that can be problematic. Um, I did alter this talk just a little bit from the last time I gave it trying to take out any images that were um, a little more disturbing but I, I will say that there are some pictures of birds throughout this talk uh, where they have sustained some uh, injuries. Um, things that presented to our hospital. So um, just making you guys aware of that, uh, that you might see some things that could be a little disturbing, um, but I didn't try to put anything in too graphic for you guys. Okay, so to first go over uh, birds having trauma from being around other birds. Um, I will say that it's a common problem that I run into quite a bit. Because uh, most of us who have birds don't have just one bird. Most of us have multiple birds. It's, it's hard to have just one. Um, and so, you know, our birds may not always get along or, you know, sometimes they will get along and they're great, but then they're like people and sometimes they get into little tussles and arguments and fights every once in a while, even though they love each other and care about each other. Sometimes they just don't agree all the time and, and, and trauma can happen. Um, and I put these pictures up here because if you see the picture at the lower left hand corner there, uh, this picture was taken when I was in one of those lorikeet exhibits um, that you see at lots of different like zoos or aquariums and places that are really fun to go to because you walk into those exhibits and they have all these lorikeets flying all over the place and you get to feed them and it's a whole lot of fun. And a lot of times I think when people are in there, they're just having so much fun having the birds land on them and getting to interact with them. They may not always be watching the interactions that are happening between the birds. And a lot of times they think that the birds just get along great and everything's fine. And they have this wonderful relationship where there's never any problems. And if you look at the picture at the lower left hand corner there, all those birds that are on my hand, eating out of my hand look fine. They are doing well in close proximity to one another. Uh, not really showing any signs of tension on with their expressions or their body language. But if you look at the picture to the right there, where you can see me um, having two lorikeets in my right hand, you can see uh, that those two lorikeets, uh, looking at their expressions, they're not exactly happy with one another right in that moment. Me, I'm sitting there excited, uh, smiling, happy to be around all these birds, having this bird on my head. I'm having a great time. But if you look at the birds in the corner there, um, they're actually starting to get into a little bit of an argument, probably associated with that food. You know, uh, food is definitely something that is a resource. And a lot of birds are going to be guarding their resources. Uh, it's a, a common 
uh, behavior that happens in the wild. And these birds are still wild animals. They're just living in our homes. Um, and so these behaviors where they may do things like resource guarding um, can still come about. And so the one bird um, that's closest to the apple that's in my hand, you can see him lifting up his little foot and he's kind of kicking the other bird um, away. And it's kind of a subtle, subtle picture down there, but you can see it where he is telling the other one to, to back off. And, you know, in this big aviary sit setting, where these birds have the ability to fly, a lot of times when birds are flighted, they have a lot of space, they can easily get away from one another. And so, you know, in this situation, you're probably not running into too many problems as far as fighting goes um, between birds. And I've been a veterinarian for uh, places that have had groups of lorikeets. And honestly, I don't remember them ever having problems with trauma between the birds. But it's because a lot of times when fighting happens in these situations where birds can fly away, it's a lot more um, of birds just sort of displaying and acting like they're tough and then somebody backs down. Um, but it's a little different in our homes because sometimes in our homes, um, our birds are, are clipped. Um, maybe they can't fly and maybe they can't get away from one another as easily as they would um, in these bigger aviary situations. So here's an example of two African greys that live in the same home. Um, and the other thing I think that is common is a lot of people will think, well, if they're the same species, they must ultimately get along. And though that's true for some individuals, it's not true for all individuals. Um, these two African greys live in the same home, but they're definitely not friends. And you can see from the uh, images here, the one's a little blurry on the, the left-hand side, um, but in that image, you can see the one gray is kind of pulling back away from the other as the other one's leaning towards it. Um, the one that's leaning towards the, the one on the lower portion of the chair, she's kind of got her head down. She's in a little bit more of a stance saying, hey, don't come any closer. And the other one's recognizing that and starting to back off. Uh, in the other picture on the right hand side there, you can see that they're both starting to open up their beaks and they're both starting to be just a little bit more fluffy. The one that is a feather picker, it's a little harder to tell that she's sort of fluffy, but you can kind of see her putting her wings out a little bit. And so they're both sort of doing these display behaviors that are saying, hey, don't come any closer. I'm not really wanting you around right now. Um, and if these birds are in a home where they're clipped, then they may not be able to actually get away from one another or fly away from one another um, easily. And even if they are flighted, they still potentially in, a, in not a um, wild situation where they have wherever they want to fly to when they're in a more confined setting, uh, they may actually get into a actual contact fight with one another. And um, when I have birds that come in for having gotten into a fight with another bird in the home, um, the two most common places that I will see injuries from other birds is on the beak and on the feet. Those are the most common spots that you're going to see a problem. Now, certainly they can injure each other on any part of their body, but those feathers do a really good job of being at least a little bit of a barrier um, before a beak gets lower to the skin. Uh, so, you know, feathers might get pulled out, but as far as lesions under the skin, um, they're not as common or on the skin uh, underneath the feathers aren't as common. It's much more common for us to see injuries on the beak and the toes because um, those are easy areas to grab. They're not covered by those protective uh, soft feathers um, and much more easy to be injured. So just a couple photos here. Um, the little military macaw on the left side of the screen here, you can see that she's got a bandage on her foot. Um, and the reason she's got a bandage on that foot is because she was in her home with her sibling uh, who was a hyacinth macaw. And she climbed over to his 
cage and he didn't like her on his cage, which is also a, I would say, common problem um, that we will see inciting uh, trauma between two birds and fights between two birds is when one bird climbs onto the other bird's cage um, and toes get bitten real easily through those cage bars. So something to, to keep in mind in homes where you have multiple birds is, um, trying to not let them climb onto each other's cages unless they really know each other quite well and are not disturbed by each other climbing on each other's cages. But, you know, something to really keep an eye on, be cautious of not having them, you know, one out free to do whatever it wants and can climb on whoever's cage they feel like while others are caged uh, up and unable to come out. I've seen that quite commonly where one bird has been allowed to be free, climbed over on somebody else's cage who wasn't allowed to be free. And that one that was in the cage just breached up through the bars and, and injured a toe. Uh, that military macaw ended up having to have her toe amputated because the blood supply was damaged to that foot. And so um, she wasn't gonna be able to heal appropriately. So she did have to have that toe amputated. This other little bird here to the right, um, unfortunately a larger bird uh, reached through the cage bars. Um, I don't remember what species it was that had sustained the or caused the injury um, to this little one, but it was a larger bird from what I remember. But basically it just reached right in there and grabbed the upper beak a bit down hard enough and it lost its upper beak. Now beak injuries, depending upon the severity, can be kind of difficult to, to deal with. And I'll show you on the next slide here. This is a little green cheek conure who kind of had the same fate as the last one, um, where a larger bird had grabbed on to the beak. And when that larger bird grabbed onto the beak, what it did is it punctured through the left hand side of the beak. And so if you look at the photo to the right, you can see that there's a chunk of upper beak missing. And that's because where the trauma actually hit was right through there. And then it actually bent the beak over um, the keratin on the beak. And hopefully you guys can see my little pointer here. Um, but on the right side of the bird's beak, it essentially bent it all the way over to where the little junction is between the keratin of the beak and that soft sear on the side there where the nostril is. It like folded it over. Um, so pretty, pretty serious trauma that this little bird sustained. Um, beak injuries, when they happen, if you're going to have any success at repairing them, they need to be dealt with very quickly. Um, they need to be dealt with uh, within 24 hours uh, of the injury occurring. The tissue from where the beak grows, the germinal tissue, really is right at that base of that beak. Uh, the and if that germinal tissue is damaged, then that keratin isn't gonna grow out on the beak normally. And so um, when birds sometimes lose their upper beaks from injuries from other birds, uh, it, they often don't grow back well. Um, and if they do grow back, they often don't grow back normally. Um, but I will say I've known several individuals who have lost their upper beak because of injuries from other birds and they've learned to compensate well. They often need to have different diets, um, softer diets. They often need to have um, their lower beak trimmed uh, routinely because now you don't have that lower beak uh, grinding against that upper beak to keep that keratin nice and trimmed. So they have some more maintenance needs uh, in their future ahead of them, um, but they can often do well. Now this little bird, what we ended up doing because the injury occurred and then the owners got her into the hospital pretty quickly. We were able to put a little patch on the upper beak. We essentially, you know, flipped the beak back to position where it was supposed to be. Um, we put a little patch on the upper beak and there was a surgical procedure um, where we placed a wire on the opposite side of the beak here between the beak and the, the bone by the nostril um, to try to cause a uh, union and, and fusion at that site where the injury had occurred. Uh, I don't have a photo of that um, surgery or anything, but the picture over to the right here, this is what the bird looked like after it healed. And so although this looks 
odd. Um, I would say this was quite a bit more successful than I expected it to be um, because the right half of this, the bird's face, the beak, um, I should have taken a photo of that side as well, but the right side was nice and continuous. We really just lost this chunk. And ultimately in the long run, the bird always sort of had this weird um, chunk missing and overgrowth of the beak on the lower part here. You can kind of see how long that keratin is that needs to be trimmed down and how long this lower beak is that needs to be trimmed down. But this bird really is able to function with half of its beak and, um, still able to do okay, um, much better than those individuals who lose the upper beak en entirely. So although he looks different um, and it's definitely not like normal, this would be closer to uh, high success rate than some other individuals. Um, some get lucky and there's just little punctures that happen. If they get a little puncture in the beak, that can heal fine, uh, though they may be prone to, when they have that puncture, uh, before it completely heals, they can be prone to infections because if you puncture into the beak, deep into that beak, there's a little sinus tissue um, that connects with the, the respiratory system. And so it, you just have to be aware that uh, infection is, is highly possible while they're going through the healing process. But as that keratin heals, again, the germinal tissue where it grows from is at the base of the beak. And so it grows from the base down to the tip. And so it can take a few months but any punctures that happen can slowly have that keratin uh, cover over the site as it heals down, but can, can take several months. And sometimes they'll always have um, a little bit of what looks like a you know, scar in the beak, uh, like a little indentation, or you'll kind of see like a little ridging occurring in the keratin long-term for them uh, after they've sustained these injuries. Um, here's just one other example of a, bird versus another bird injury. Uh, this little green cheek con here, he unfortunately um, got grabbed by an African gray um, and had his eyes punctured. And so you can see he doesn't really have um, the normal shape to his eye and that's because the eye was punctured and deflated. This is after him having recovered um, and we decided to not remove his eyes or anything like that because he was functional, doing well and comfortable in the long run. Um, but this little guy lost his, lost his vision in the long run. So, um, you know, when we have birds in our homes, the, the bird versus bird injuries can help us to recognize that, um, you know, we need to be cautious of our birds interacting with the other individuals in the home, um, making sure that we know what they're doing, where they are at all times, who they're playing with, who's out, um, because birds don't always get along. It'd be nice if they all got along really well, but you know, they don't always get along great. So knowing your bird, knowing who is uh, good with others and who is not good with others uh, is really important and just being mindful of them uh, being out and interacting Okay, so on to the next of uh, birds versus other animals. That's the other thing that I commonly see coming into the hospital um, as a problem where, you know, a lot of pet owners who have birds have other pets as well. Um, and, you know, sometimes birds don't mix well with other species. And sometimes they, they can be with other species just fine, and sometimes they can't. So um, I'll just go over a few different circumstances I've seen. So these two birds here um, were both birds that had unfortunate uh, interactions with other, um, with dogs. And so the African gray on the uh, left side of the screen there, that is Sadie. She was actually one of my patients for many years when I was in Connecticut. Um, and although I, I didn't actually see her for the injury that she sustained from a dog, I was dealing with her for problems years after the, the dog incident. Um, you can see in this picture here of Sadie that uh, she had an unfortunate uh, interaction with a large dog. I believe it was a German Shepherd um, where she ended up losing all the toes on her left foot um, and she ended up missing one toe on her right foot and just had some a little bit of deformities um, to that right foot as well. She ended up having to have amputations because of 
that injury she sustained from the dog. Um, and, you know, she healed well. She learned to compensate. Animals are amazing in what they learn to deal with. And, and birds are quite miraculous in some of the things that they have sustained and been able to deal with. Um, so she did well in the long run, but, you know, she never was able to function as a completely normal individual um, because she couldn't perch like a normal bird would. She couldn't um, groom herself as a normal bird would. She, she did pretty well, but you know, there was certainly some things that were um, a little more difficult for her. Now, the other bird on the, the right here is Eclectus. Um, he was sort of an interesting story. He uh, got injured actually by a chihuahua. So that's the other thing that I want to point out is that um, when birds have trauma from dogs. It's never one particular breed of dog, size of dog, um, that's a problem. It's really all across the board. So Sadie was attacked by, again, I believe a German Shepherd and the Eclectus, he was attacked by a Chihuahua. So from big to small, um, any dog can do damage to a bird. Um, this little Eclectus here, the injury that he sustained from the Chihuahua, um, thankfully for him wasn't so bad he actually just had a uh, couple punctures um, in the skin from the chihuahua uh, so he didn't have too much problems the other thing to know is that with the eclectus and the chihuahua they did Um, the bird had cornered the chihuahua down the hallway. And so, you know, again, they had got along for years. They lived together for years. They didn't have problems for years. But then when something, uh, when the chihuahua felt cornered by the parrot, uh, the parrot was not exactly being the nicest individual, then the chihuahua did what a dog would do or any animal that feels threatened in some way, he reacted um, and he bit the bird and the bird did have to come in and get pain medication and also get on some antibiotics. Uh, this individual was actually um, injured by a raccoon. So this bird lived outside uh, in a nice outdoor aviary. Uh, this was a bird that I knew in California. Um, so he lived in a nice outdoor aviary and lived in that aviary for years. Um, but unfortunately, raccoons being raccoons who love to get their little dexterous hands through cage bars and things, uh, was able to reach the bird's cage uh, in the nighttime um, and caused uh, such a severe injury to this bird's wing that the bird ended up having to have the wing amputated. Um, so this is post amputation. This was several days after the procedure. Um, you know, you can just see that the wing is missing. The skin's a little bit red from the trauma and the swelling that had occurred and then the surgery that had to happen. Um, the bird recovered well, but the bird never is going to be able to fly again. So, um, you know, of course, this wasn't another pet in the home, um, but it was injury from another animal. And so if you have outdoor aviaries, just something to be, really be mindful of, of what potential predators do you have in your area um, and really making sure there's good reinforcements on the cages uh, and spacing between what the, the bird can get access to at the edge of the cage versus uh, the true uh, exterior of the cage. Um, sometimes having a little bit of a few inch barrier uh, where it's sort of like double paneled is good uh, in outdoor aviary so that things like raccoons who are a little more dexterous and smart um, can't reach their, their uh, little hands through. Um, so uh, the next one, uh, back to sort of our indoor pets that could potentially be a problem, um, birds and cats. I will tell you, I've actually had many more bird versus dog problems than bird versus cat problems. And I think it goes to the uh, size being the, the biggest uh, factor of why we see more uh, problems. Because although uh, people often, you know, everybody knows that cats um, will certainly, they're predators, they'll hunt, um, they tend to go for smaller 
birds. And so I would say when I have had it be a problem with a cat versus a bird, it tends to be the smaller species. So your um, smaller size conures, uh, cockatiels, budgies, parrotlets, and then of course our little like passerines um, that have been more problems with cats. Usually are like African gray size birds and above. I haven't seen problems with cats with them as much, um, though it's always certainly a possibility. And a uh, point to bring up is if you look at the picture on the left here of this cat and this bird, they are both on a tree stand together. Um, the cat is just, you know, looking back, turned away from the bird, um, but looking back at the bird and this bird is uh, aggressively approaching the cat. There's many things in this bird's body language that are telling you that it is upset about the cat being close. Uh, its head is sort of down, its uh, feathers are really ruffled up around its shoulders, it's trying to make itself look bigger, its mouth is open, it's really approaching that cat in a very aggressive manner. Um, and if that bird decides to bite that cat, there's nothing to say that that cat can't turn around and hurt the bird back, you know, even though the cat is leaving the tree stand uh, in this photo, you know, something could happen in this instance. And so it's something to, again, just be very much aware of where your animals are. Um, if you have multiple different species in the home, when your birds are out, where are the other animals? What are they doing? Um, just to be safe and make sure that you aren't going to run into any problems. Um, the photo on the right is a little cockatiel uh, that had been chewed on the back by a cat. So again, going back to uh, the cats tend to go more for the smaller size birds, but this, this bird um, did get chewed on a little bit by a cat. And, and mouths of animals, particularly cats, are not very clean. Um, there's a lot of bacteria that are in the mouths of cats and, and dogs. Um, that are normally there. They're bacteria that are just inherently on their mucous membranes. Um, but when they bite, uh, essentially making that wound, they're inoculating those nasty bacteria that are in their mouth right into that wound. And it can be quite deadly. Um, just a little uh, a bite from a cat, even if it's not the injury itself is not um, deadly in and of itself, the bacteria from that cat's mouth can cause the the bird to pass away within 72 hours it can be that rapid and so anytime that there is an injury that a bird sustains from um, a bite wound from a dog or a cat they really need to be on antibiotics um, and really need to be seen by a veterinarian even if it is just one small puncture and the bird seems to be fine antibiotics are a must in these cases, just because of how quickly it can, can turn deadly just simply from the bacteria. Okay, um, so birds versus people. <laughs> um, unfortunately, sometimes birds get under our feet um, or we have them out and you know maybe they're flying around doing things we aren't always necessarily paying attention to exactly where they are um, and sometimes we can injure our birds on accident uh, this military macaw this was one of my mentors patients um, i i didn't actually see this bird as one of my my pets or uh, one of my patients but my mentor had and um he had said that the bird had actually accidentally gotten uh, sat on by the owner. Uh, um, the bird was like just kind of cuddling in the couch or something like that. The owner didn't recognize it was there. The owner sat on it accidentally, quickly recognized that there was a problem, got up, but the damage had been done. Um, and you can see in these photos here that that right foot is definitely abnormal. Um, the bird's holding it off to the side there. Um, it has had a fracture of the tibiotarsal bone uh, when the bird is under anesthesia that you can see there in that photo to the right. Um, you can see that that foot can be flipped up, uh, flipped around com completely. Uh, not normal, uh, definitely something that required um, surgical intervention. So this bird did actually have a surgery to repair that leg and ultimately healed fine. Um, but certainly a, uh, a big injury that this poor little one went through. And, you know, again, it wasn't the owner's intent, to, of course, to cause this sort of injury. Um, but, you know, knowing where they are, where the birds are in the house at the time um, is when they're out uh, is really important and something to 
help us prevent injuries. Uh, just a quick story from uh, one of my own birds. Uh, we had mentioned in the beginning I had a bird named Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and where, when I had him, um, one time he was out of his cage. Well, he always in, when I had him at that time, he had always stayed out of his cage. He was a free flight of bird. He lived in my bedroom. Um, and one time I had walked into my bedroom and he saw me come in and he flew down and he used to like to, um, scream at my feet. He used to like to stand in front of my feet and just scream at my feet. It was just some little game he liked to do. And, uh, I was walking in the room quickly and he flew down to land in front of me, um, to do this little thing and I, I stepped down actually on him and quickly recognized he was underneath my feet and I picked my foot up but I rolled him across the floor um and he was a I mean he's a zebra finch a tiny little 13 gram bird and he got underneath my foot and I rolled him across the floor with my foot um thankfully I didn't break anything I mean I could have killed him if I actually put my full body weight on him um but you know he had sprains and poor little guy was a little uncomfortable from what I you know did to him and it was a complete accident um so after that I treaded a little bit more lightly and did not enter my room as quickly um as I had at that time uh knowing that you know uh, I was lucky that I didn't cause much more of an injury with him um, here's an example, this is an x-ray um, of a Quaker parrot that had sustained an injury from its owner, again, totally an accident. What we are looking at here, I'll outline it if you guys can see my um, cursor here. This is the femur bone. So we're looking at the back leg. So here's the femur. And then this bone here is the tibiotarsus. So it's a little different in birds. We have a tibia, they have a tibiotarsus. Um, and you can see these bones aren't exactly aligned the way that they're supposed to. This sort of flat surface of the tibiotarsal bone should actually be sitting right here underneath the um, femur bone. Uh, also, as you run down along the length of the tibiotarsus, you can see that it actually is fractured down here. Now, this picture um, was a few weeks after the injury, so there actually is some healing that you can see sort of between the bone fragments. But what happened with this bird was uh, the bird was flying over the owner's head. Um, and for some reason, the owner had to reach up quickly to, to get the bird and he grabbed the bird and he grabbed the bird's leg. Um, and it, unfortunately with the grasp that he did, it caused the bird to not only fracture that tibiotarsal bone right there, but also caused a luxation. So it, it um, popped that joint out of place. Uh, so this bird sustained two injuries. Again, completely accident. It wasn't something that was meant to, to happen. Um, the owner didn't intend for this sort of injury, but it did occur. So it was just sort of, he quickly grabbed the bird. I, I don't remember the exact reason why, but he had to quickly grab the bird out of the air, just sort of an instinctual thing to grab him and this injury occurred. Okay. Um, on to the next potential injuries. We talked about, uh, you know, all the different bird versus um, other uh, living creatures, birds, animals, people. Um, but what about birds versus inanimate objects? Um, so to start off with the cage, this photo here is of a gray sticking her head through a cage bar because she had broken the bar on this cage. This cage is a little too small for this bird. She's a little too strong for it. She was able to break this cage apart. Uh, she broke that cage apart and was able to get her head through the cage bars there. Um, Thankfully, nothing happened to this bird, but you could obviously see from this photo how this could potentially turn into a problem for this bird. Um, you know, we, this bird could potentially get stuck um, if there was a dog, a cat, something else, you know, another animal in the house that could potentially grab that bird with the head out. I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, you can imagine the horrible possibilities of what could happen of this bird getting its head out through a cage bars inappropriately. Um, now, here's an example of an African gray that had an injury sustained from its cage where it was standing on the cage 
door um, and the cage door had gotten shut quickly. Um, the, the owner, I think, didn't recognize that the bird was on the cage bars of the door, um, had shut the cage door. She was on there and she got injured. And she also broke, again, the, the tibiotarsal bone. Um, and so she had gone through a quite a long recovery. She had a couple of complications during her um, procedure or, or during her healing, I should say. Um, so she took a while to actually heal. But um, in this x-ray image here, you can see this tibiotarsal bone. Here's the one that is normal. And you can see how the bone is all nice and intact appropriately. And then when you look at this side, you can see the break. Now it was starting to heal in this image. And so you can see um, the little ends of the bones trying to come together, but not able to come together quite well enough. There's still an area of lucency between those bones, meaning that they weren't quite healed appropriately. Um, she ended up having two different surgical procedures on her leg. Um, and this is where she actually had a pin down the center of the leg in this photo. And some pins were coming out of the side of the leg. And there was a little bar sort of connecting all those pins that were coming out. Um, and she had about a seven week healing time. And then once she was healed, uh, this x-ray image here shows that pin that was actually down that tibiotarsal bone um, and one of the uh, extra pins that was coming out. You can see a little hole right there. That nice little circle was where another pin was but had been removed. Um, but actually at that fracture site, uh, it was had ended up healing well. And so she was able to have the, um, everything completely removed. So. Um, now birds versus their toys. I do see that occasionally as well. I would say I see more bird versus toy injuries than bird versus um, cage injuries. With the bird versus toys injuries, one of the common things that I have seen, not thankfully a lot, but occasionally, um, common enough to have it happen to several individuals to where I wanted to talk about it, um, and this budgie's trying to show off what was going on. You can see underneath the beak here, notice how on the feathers, there's a little bit of blood on the feathers. Um, so you know underneath we have the, the keratin of the beak and then right underneath there, there's that like soft little pocket that they sort of have where it goes to uh, attaches the beak to like the um, soft tissue of their skin. Well, those hooks that we use on the toys to like attach toys to cages. Um, I've seen it happen a few times where the bird has been playing with those little hooks and got the hook grasped onto the beak and actually punctured through that little soft spot right underneath um, the mandible there, right under, right on that soft spot of the skin. Um, and so that's what happened to this little budgie here. So he was chewing on one of those little hooks. That's uh, that same little hook that is used for most parrot toys, attaching them to the cage. Um, he was chewing on that inappropriately and it had punctured through that spot. Uh, here's a picture of a macaw who was playing with a bell inside of, or that was inside of some sort of toy. And you can see that that bell, the actual little dingly part of the bell there, uh, got stuck on the end of the beak. So it had just lodged itself right onto the tip of the beak. Um, you know, <laughs> it had to be removed. Thankfully, nothing that's too injurious to the bird. Um, it was something that just, you know, scraped the keratin a little bit, didn't puncture through the keratin or do anything like that. But something to keep in mind that, you know, sometimes uh, if you start to see toys that are damaged, uh, it's good to, uh, you know, start getting rid of them, replace them, get new toys in, um, because it tends to be those toys that have been sitting there and used multiple times that aren't quite 100% perfect, uh, that, you know, they're meant to be destroyed. Um, but after some period of time, uh, those pieces that start to get exposed that shouldn't be exposed to the bird, once you start to see those, good to get rid of them, get new toys, um, because that's when we start to see problems. I think I have, oh, not yet. Um, I thought I had an image of it, but I, I guess I might've taken it off. Um, the other thing I will say with, when it comes to toys, that's a common injury is um, with like rope toys. Um, I've had many times where birds have chewed on rope toys or rope perches and frayed them. And when they start to fray them, um, you have to be really careful with those things. It's best to cut any sort of frayed little rope pieces off of those things um, because I have had two 
common problems. One is those pieces of rope getting wrapped around toes. Um, I had a Moluccan cockatoo actually where we had to amputate the foot, uh, the entire foot of that bird because it had uh, one of those Boeing um, rope things and it had just frayed the end over time and then was playing on it and just got wrapped up all tangled around its foot, um, cut off circulation to that foot um, and had to had to have the toe or the leg actually amputated. Um, the other common thing that I have seen um, from frayed rope toys or cottony like toys is birds eating them and ingesting them inappropriately and getting obstructions. Um, so definitely having those toys that are rope or fibrous things, if they start to get frayed, either completely getting rid of them um, and getting new stuff or cutting those frayed pieces off so that the bird can't continue to you know, have those little things uh, be in the way and potentially injure themselves with it. Okay, so birds versus household items. Um, so there's many dangers in the household and I don't think I could uh, have enough time to talk about every possible little thing that could occur. So I just wanted to hit on some um, common things that I, that I have seen uh, birds come in for from household injuries. Um, this little budgie here, you can see that she's actually stuck to a mouse trap. Um, and unfortunately, that's something that I've had happen multiple times. And it's, it's, it's with the small birds. It's always with the small birds. I don't think I've ever had it happen with a, a larger bird. Um, but, you know, these little glue traps that are supposed to be humane glue traps um, that a mouse gets on and then you can take the mouse off of it. Um, if a little bird lands on them, they are just as sticky for a bird as they are for a little mouse. Um, and I've had many birds that I have had to take off of those little glue traps. So um, just be cautious if you use those, know where you're placing them, best to place them in areas where your bird is not going to have any ability to have any access to, um, because they can be, you know, just as dangerous, even though they're, again, meant to be sort of these humane things that you're supposed to check and find and say, oh, if there's a little mouse stuck on it, I can take them off. Um, the reality is, is if you don't check them, um, and it's easy for us to kind of forget that we put those things there, um, uh, your bird could get stuck and, you know, your bird could potentially perish just like a mouse could um, if they're not able to get out and you and you don't recognize that you know they've gone missing and attached to something like this so something to keep in mind um i tried to take out a little more graphic photo from this one this is um, a bird that um unfortunately had flown into a pot of boiling water um, in the kitchen so you know we always tell people don't keep your birds in the kitchen while you are cooking. Um, if you are cooking, it is best to have the birds elsewhere in the house, in their cages secured, um, because freak accidents can happen. Um, and it happened in this bird's case. There was a pot of boiling water um, on the stove and the bird flew into the, the room um, and unfortunately landed in the exactly wrong spot into that pot of boiling water and got horrible burns. Um, and these are burns that, you know, just like a person, you know, these are third degree burns and, and these are, these are not only very uncomfortable, um, but they can be deadly for a small bird because there's a lot of, um, stuff that happens with these types of burns in your, in your body, um, that can be very detrimental. So not only do they need to have their, pain addressed. They need to be on antibiotics. They need to make sure they are being hydrated appropriately. I mean, there's just a lot that goes into the care of, of this sort of uh, injury that occurs. So best thing to say is don't keep, don't let your bird into the kitchen when you're cooking. Just be very cautious and have them out of there. Okay. Um, so like I said, I didn't want to go into all the different possibilities of what could happen in homes, but um, the one other thing I wanted to just sort of briefly uh, hit on is um, sort of, you know, look at your home and sort of imagine what accidents are waiting to happen in there. Um, thinking ahead, uh, being observant and um, 
trying to bird proof your home as best you possibly can. I know that's not um, 100% uh, easy to do, um, or we're not able to do that 100% in any situation, but you know, just looking at your home and, and seeing where could there potentially be um, an injury that could happen. This photo that I have up here, this is um, one of my one of my birds. Um, and it's a cute photo that I took because I, I, he's next to my bookshelves and he's looking at all my books and all my binders and everything. Um, but the reason I put it up as uh, imagine an accident that could be waiting to happen is imagine if, you know, he's sitting there perching um, on the, the shelving there. Um, but if he decided to reach up and grab one of those books, um, and try to lift himself up. What if that book kind of slipped out from this bookshelf? That's a, so there's some pretty heavy books there. Um, and what if they, he fell with a book, um, and had a book land on him? You know, it, it could be, uh, horrible injury that happened. Um, I had a, I did have a patient who had, um, had a basket fall on her. She was like a cockatoo, an umbrella cockatoo who was climbing on a basket and the basket tipped and she fell and the basket fell on her. Um, and they unfortunately fell the wrong way and um, she broke her back and she remained paralyzed. Um, so something like that could happen of my bird climbing onto my bookshelf. So I took this photo and then I properly took him off um, because even though it looks really cute, it's an accident waiting to happen. So they're not allowed near bookshelves or anything like that. So things to just watch out for um, and, and be aware of, of where there could be problems in your home. Um, one other thing I did want to talk about as well, just real briefly of common injuries that I have seen that I didn't take any photos of just because I didn't, hadn't ever actually taken a photo of it, um, is birds that have been injured near doors. Um, if birds are flighted and they like to hang out on um, the door um, and you shut doors, just make sure of where birds are. Um, I have had multiple injuries where birds have gotten toes injured, legs injured um, from them sitting on top of doors and people shutting doors. So, um, okay, so that is what I have for um, the injuries part. So now we're going to go over to the next um, talk and we're going to bring up, oops, sorry, move this and we're going to bring up the next one. Oops. Okay. So slightly different, slightly different topics here, uh, um, but that's okay. Um, so switching gears, now we're gonna talk about more fun, happy things than trauma um, and just fun stuff that you can do with your birds. Now you guys are in Connecticut and I'm in Arizona. So I have a little bit of a different sort of um, uh, gardening times than you guys have. Um, like for example, for me right now, now is the time to garden. I know you guys are having a snowstorm, I guess, coming. Um, so you guys probably are not even thinking about gardening, but for me being in Arizona, winter time is the time to garden. So right now, this is what I'm thinking about. Hopefully when the spring comes around for you guys, you guys can start thinking about this fun stuff. Um, and so I like to do a lot of uh, foraging with fresh stuff for, for my birds. Um, so everybody knows, I think probably the benefits of foraging with your birds. Foraging allows birds to exhibit normal behaviors that they would be exhibiting in the wild. Um, in the wild, the statistics vary from one species to the next, but birds spend, parrots spend about 60% of their day flying around and looking for their food. They're foraging for 60% of their waking hours. And in captivity, they really, studies have shown when they have food in their food dish, they only spend about 5% of their day uh, looking for their food. So foraging with them in captivity can be fun because you start having their food in different places or presenting it to them in different ways. Um, and it can allow them to take up more of their day, exhibit more of 
their normal behaviors that they would be in the wild, um, engaging their minds, um, and they can really enjoy foraging. And there's many ways to forage, um, but one of the ways that you can forage is with fun, fresh things that uh, you can either purchase from the grocery store, fresh items, or stuff that you can grow in your gardens. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, this photo here, this is my Amazon. Again, he's actually out in my front yard. Um, in This is a Palo Verde tree, which is a safe tree for, for um, birds and other animals. Um, and he actually enjoys foraging on the uh, little flowers um, as they are coming up as little buds um, from the, the, the tree. So I caught him uh, getting, reaching out or grabbing one of those little flower buds that was popping up. And, you know, when you look at uh, studies of what birds eat in the wild, they eat quite a variety of, of different things, um, but there are a lot of parrots that eat flowers and flower buds. Uh, so this is a very normal thing for a parrot to be doing if he were out in the wild. Um, so because this is a safe tree, and I don't know that this would grow well at all in Connecticut. This is definitely an Arizona tree. This is a hot weather tree. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't suggest you have this particular tree around, but I get lucky because I can have this one. Um, but you guys can have some trees that, that you know, wouldn't go well for me here. Um, you know, trees that can be safe for them to chew on out there. Um, uh, apple, willow, those are very safe for them. So, but we're going to get into some of the stuff that you can just easily grow in your garden from year to year, because a tree is kind of a big thing to, to be growing um, and a, a bit of a commitment. Um, so some, some herbs that are safe for birds to have um, that you can grow in your garden that can be really nice uh, for them and supply them with a little bit of different nutrition and fun for them to, to chew up. Um, there's lots of different herbs that are out there I just put these few ones up here um, that I've had personal experience with. Um, cilantro, parsley, uh, basil. I mean, they're all pretty easy things for people to grow in little gardens, whether you do it outside or even in little, um, uh, like having those little uh, pots by your windows, little planters by your windows that you could grow some stuff right now uh, in the winter time uh, for your birds if you wanted. Um, and, and really they can eat the plant at really any point in its, in its growth phase. Um, all the different parts of these particular plants are safe for them and fun for them to, to forage on. So here's an example um, of my Amazon again. Uh, he's gonna demonstrate quite a few different things here in this in this talk um, about him foraging on cilantro. So I'm pretty lucky, at least I think I am, uh, um, that I can grow cilantro pretty nicely in my garden. Um, and I'll have it as these tiny little shoots that come out, but I have quite a bit of it that just grows on its own really easily. And so I don't personally use all of it because it's quite a bit that actually grows. And so it'll grow into these really long, um, tall uh, bushes almost. Um, and I'll pull those for and bring them in for the birds. And so you can see that I've got this really big uh, cilantro plant um, that I've pulled from the roots. Um, and he's there chewing on the harder base at the picture to the right and the picture to the left he is chewing on um, those softer leaves. If you also look uh, you can see that there are the little seed pods um, or seed heads that are kind of popping up there um, on the plant itself. Those are safe for them to, to eat as well um, and a lot of fun. So you're getting different nutrition at, at different parts of the plant. That more fibrous uh, base that's going to be uh, composed of, again, much higher fiber um, for them. And then when you get to that more little soft leafy part, that's going to be more like simple carbs for them to be chewing. And then when you get to the little seed portion, well, that's going to be a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat for them. Um, and just a few different, again, photos of him um, playing with his cilantro. And honestly, when I pull one of these, I mean, this can give him a couple of hours of fun to, to mess around with because um, he just forages on different parts of it uh, throughout the day. I just hang it there on his tree stand or I've, I've roped it in um, between um, the branches of his cage uh, so that he can just have fun foraging through it. He'll sit underneath it after a while, like he'll uh, pretend I imagine 
that like he's in the rainforest and will canopy with it. I'm not sure what's going through his mind, but <laughs> that's what I kind of imagine he's doing is he's like hiding out underneath it. So he's getting to exhibit these normal behaviors um, that he would be doing in the wild and, and having fun in the house. Uh, a couple of my other birds, uh, one of my grays actually climbing down into the garden there um, to forage along that cilantro. Um, and then I even use it for my little guys. I, I have little zebra finches and they love it too. I mean, they will, the, the, they don't go so much for like the stemmy part of it because that's a little too coarse for them. Um, but they love to chew up the softer leaves. Um, and I've even seen them when they don't eat some of the, the longer stemmy parts, I have seen them actually take it up to like nesting areas to, to sit with. So, um, but they also, I've seen them, the finches eat the little flowers as they're flowering from there. Um, again, that whole part of that plant is, is safe for them to be chewing. Um, so, and various different species representing uh, how fun it can be for them to interact with. Okay, um, other types of things that we can grow in our uh, gardens in the cabbage family, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. Again, all parts of those plants are okay for them to be uh, consuming. Um, that's one of my chickens. Uh, I tried to take this photo to show the broccoli that I had in my garden, but um, <laughs> it the cilantro definitely was out competing the broccoli, but I promise that there's some broccoli back there. Um, and what I have done, because uh, if you've grown broccoli, you know, you're getting the, like to get the broccoli uh, florette part um, for us. That's what we enjoy to eat. Um, so what I've done is I've, I will often take that, I'll harvest that for myself, um, but then I leave the other portion of the plant for my birds to then de destroy um, and have fun with and, and tear apart and eat. Or um, some of my smaller birds, like my, my um, finches, uh, if the leaves are moistened, they've taken baths inside of it before. And I know a lot of small birds do like to kind of bathe um, amongst foliage, you know, if you missed any sort of uh, leafy vegetables that you give to birds, you will often see them like kind of rubbing up against them and almost taking a little bath uh, inside of them. So it's kind of a other way for them to exhibit normal behaviors. Okay, um, I don't know how much you guys necessarily have access to this, uh, to citrus out there, um, but in Arizona, we do have quite a bit of, of citrus um, and citrus is safe. Different parts of the plant are safe. Lemons, lime, um, oranges, grapefruit. And we, Again, in Arizona, the these citrus trees are actually very um, common. A lot of people have different citrus trees. Um, and as long as they are not treated with any herbicides or pesticides, um, you can safely allow your birds to forage around on them. Yes, we know that they can eat the fruit. Um, you know, people do say uh, that you have to be careful with the acidity of the fruit. And that is true. You don't want them to just like be eating an orange every single day. That would be a little too much, um, but they can certainly eat pieces of the fruit um, and be completely safe. They can have a lot of fun tearing into the rind of the fruit, um, but the actual tree itself is fun for them to forage around in and, and chew up and destroy as well. Um, so, I will take cuttings from, uh, I have a lemon tree and a couple family members have other citrus trees. And when we cut the, the branches, um, rather than discard them, uh, I will take them home and I will sort of uh, weave them through the cage bars. Um, and so then they can, the birds can uh, chew on those leaves. Um, and it actually smells really nice because if you have like a, a orange tree or what have you. Um, it actually kind of smells sort of orangey in the room as they're sort of chewing it up. Um, and if there's flowers on there, they're okay to eat those flowers. Again, those are safe for them. And again, they do eat flowers in the wild. Those little flower buds are safe. Um, so uh, you can see in the photo to the right there with my Amazon again, I kind of uh, sort of weaved the plant branches uh, around his little boing and he's having a lot of fun with it. Um, and just a few more photos of him with his uh, plant branches weaved around that boing there. Uh, he's just really enjoying 
um, tearing it apart. And you can see he's kind of pinning his eye on that picture to the right, which is um, indication of excitement. He was really happy to be messing around with this stuff. So I don't have this available all year round, um, but I have it intermittently available, um, particularly when we're, it's the time of year to be doing trimmings. Um, and so they're having a lot of fun with it at those times. Uh, the other thing that I've personally grown in my garden for my birds uh, are the more traditional seeds, both millet and sunflower I have grown. Um, the sunflower actually kind of did it on accident. Um, and of course, you know, when we're thinking about things like sunflower, we don't want to overdo it with them. We don't want them to have too much of it, but a little bit as a treat is fine. This is just a picture of the millet that I've uh, grown, just one of them. Um, and you can see how it comes up as this nice sort of green plant and it, feeding it to them fresh is a little bit of a different experience than feeding it to them the dry millet sticks because you can give them that whole plant uh, that they can tear the leaves off of and, and really forage around in it. Um, this is a photo, again, of my Amazon uh, with a little stick of that uh, fresh millet that was grown for him. And again, when I've had that available, I don't have it all year round. I have this at different periods of the year um, that go more with the growing season. And that's kind of the point of the foraging with fresh stuff is that you're doing it during times of the year um, with the appropriate growing season. Uh, so you don't have these, you know, some, some of these things like the millet or sunflower, you don't having it all the time. It's uh, not this excessive amount of calories all the time. It's different things during different times of the year. So we're not being excessive in any way. Other things, um, carrots, eggplant, butternut squash, um, aloe. I just have a picture of my Amazon there in front of one of my aloe plants. Um, aloe is something that they, they can chew up. Um, it's great on wounds. Uh, um, now you don't want them to, aloe just as a side note is something that you don't wanna have them um, eating a lot of it all the time because it can be a little upsetting to the GI tract if they get too much. So if they do, when my birds have foraged on my aloe, it's just like they take a couple of bites, um, nothing that I'm letting them really sit there and eat an entire aloe leaf. So, cause that'd be just a little too much. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and I'm going to go to the chat cause I see there's a few questions. Um, all right. Oh, so first question. What kind of Amazon is that? <laughs> okay. So that's a great question. Um, I get that quite a bit because he looks a little different. Um, so he actually is a blue front Amazon, but he has very, very little blue, um, on him. He had more blue when he was a baby. Uh, I've been told, um, that he's actually a subspecies of the blue front Amazon. Um, the yellow, shouldered blue front Amazon. I actually didn't know that there was a subspecies until um, somebody who was looking at him had told me that that he was that particular subspecies. So. We, we have a parrot that's a cross between a blue front and a Panama. Yeah. It looks exactly it like looks that. Looks just like it. Oh, really? Yeah. It has the red shoulder, the yellow head, uh, had the blue, and we've had her for 38 years, and we, when she was a baby, she had a blue front. And yeah. It, I don't know, maybe three, four, maybe six months, eight months down the road, she lost it. She got more yeah. It became all yellow. Well, he's got, he has probably about eight feathers that are still blue, but they're just right on the rim there. But I will say um, where I got him from, I, you know, I don't, I, I could be wrong. And I'm very open to the fact that he could potentially be a cross because I actually got him in California. He was, um, I don't know if you know, but there are uh, several Amazons that are out in the Pasadena area in California that are wild. Oh, a lot, um, of, a lot of all so, over California. Yeah, and so he's actually a wild baby um, from out there. Uh -huh. um, so it's very possible he could be a cross, but you know, I don't know until until we are better about parrot genetics. Uh, it's it's a guess. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, let me see. 
Um, oh yeah, the fresh millet looks great. Yeah, I gotta say, I was very surprised when I grew the fresh millet that it looked pretty different from you know the dried stuff on the stock, but it is quite fun for them. Um, Actually, in talking about those glue traps are not humane for, for mice or anyone. I mean, yeah. mice can rip their paws off. I use these, so this little opening here, and then I there's an end piece here to put a little peanut butter. And then, uh, I mean, every week I, ca <clears throat> I catch mice in these and I never release them in your yard because they'll be right back in your house. So I usually <laughs> drive them like five miles away. I, I know this because when you catch a mouse that hasn't been caught before, that they're, they're nervous, they're afraid of you, you're large. But in my um, bathroom closet, the, there was a mice that kept storing some seed from my, they get from feeders. And what I, I went through a period where every single day I caught a mouse there. I noticed after the first time I caught him, he was like, yeah, whatevs, I know I'm getting released, you know? <laughs> so every day he was like, he'd go in there, he'd eat, he'd get a little peanut butter meal, and then it's like, okay, come release me. So I was releasing him out in my yard and every single day. So finally I said, okay, you know, I, I, I've caught on to this and I drove him about five miles away. And suddenly I stopped catching mice again. So I know this was the <laughs> same mouse. But yeah, these are really inexpensive. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, you know, even if you have these near the birds, well, first of all, you know, unless it's like a zebra finch, they can't fit in here, but it, there's nothing in here that would harm a mouse. Glue traps are bad news inside the house or outside the house. I mean, bir outside birds get caught on them. They rip their legs off. It's, they're just horrible. They're just yeah. horrible things altogether. Yeah, but I see there's a question about if, if your bird does get caught on a fly paper, because that's what we're talking about. How do you release it? So. Yeah, um, honestly, what we're usually doing in the hospital, I don't know if you saw in the photo, it was sitting next to a bottle of armor, armor all. Um, honestly, that is what will uh, break down that sticky compound. Um, the goo gone stuff too. Now you just got to be a little careful because you don't want your bird ingesting that in any way. That's, you know, you don't want them getting those because that could be toxic for them. Um, so you have to be very cautious of about actually how you're using that and getting it off. But that is what is often used to get that glue off of them because man, that's, that glue is very sticky and very hard to, to get off. Will, will Dawn take it off or that's really only good? No. For no, it's not. It's for that that type of glue that's on there. It just doesn't work. And it's interesting, different types of um, substances that get on fur or feathers um, will respond to different agents to, to get them off. Um, but for those glue yeah. traps, it's like the, the goo gone stuff or that armor all stuff, honestly, has been the most effective at getting it off of them. Uh, I also see a question about... Uh list of safe plants. We actually have that on our website uh, under, um, I wrote some safety articles in this, there's an article about plants and an article about wood and I have links there to the safe plants. Uh, so, and I don't know if you have any other ones, Stephanie, I, I think I have like three different ones that are on there. Um. I'd have to see the, the list, um, yeah. but I know that like also Lefebvre does have a safe, um, plant and safe like wood list as well. Right. So I know it's on, on their website, they have that too. Yeah, I, you know, and Donna said that they are conflicting. It's true because nobody does, nobody does research. It's not like they're gonna take some birds and then feed them plants and everything exactly. pretty much anecdotal. So my feeling is if you see a plant is being unsafe on any list, don't let a bird near it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a completely fair, a completely fair um, statement, you know, in uh, until somebody says that, hey, we know this is safe for such and such reason, err on the side of caution. Uh, what kind of millet was that? I, I bought one of those ornamental millets at the garden store mm -hmm. and I, I dried and gave to my birds and they weren't interested, but I suspect maybe that just maybe that's a kind they don't like or that they didn't recognize because there are probably I think hundreds of varieties of millet. Yeah, you know, to be honest, I'm not the ex I'm not sure of the exact species of what type of or variety of millet that was, but where I got it from was actually from um, one of the wild bird seed stores. Um, mm -hmm. 
I got it from, from there um, and planted it from there. And actually how it first happened was totally by accident. Like it had just fallen from the wild bird feeder and then stuff started growing. I was like, I'm going to start planting that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know, the ornamental ones may not even be, be good for consumption, but potentially the ones that grow from your bird seed undoubtedly are so. Yeah. That's cool. All right, do we have some other questions? about either either half of the talk. Oh, you know, one thing, you know, um, if you want to mention about co-sleeping with birds, because that's that's something that's so dangerous and people just don't seem to understand how dangerous it is. Yeah. Um, so you like people sleeping with their birds, you mean like their birds sleeping? Okay. Yeah. Um, I definitely have I definitely don't recommend that. Um, I can tell you I have had um, I had a client not not too long ago, um, who would sleep with his birds and he rolled over on one of them one night and the bird passed away. You know, it was a little green cheek conure. Um, and he didn't cause any damage in the fact of like breaking anything, but the bird suffocated, you know? So it's, it's very dangerous. And people don't realize that because they may, they may not take the birds into their bed, but if they have a couch and they just lie down for a little nap and yeah. the bird flies over and they, they may not even, they may be asleep and not even know the bird flew over. Exactly, yeah. Do you have some more, any more questions? Uh, I, think, I think most of you know that I have arrow gardens. So I have three of them now. And so I grow all these things indoors for the birds year round, which is, really nice because then I know that there are no pesticides and there's no dirt from from cars or anything like that um so especially leafy green vegetables like chard and lettuces uh, I grow a lot of those and um lately I've been growing all these little mini peppers which if you were here at the very beginning um I'll tell you uh, Rosie just absolutely adores those those little red peppers so uh, it's very it's extremely easy to grow herbs in your house whether with an aragorn or just on the windowsill because they, the, the, the herbs that Dr. Lamb listed just, they really grow like, like wildflowers. Or you can pick them up at, at uh, your garden center or even the supermarket a lot of times will have plants like basil and dill and cilantro. And you can just pick those up and, uh, you know, actually, you know, one question I did want to ask, we talk about parrots like they're one species, but of course there are about 400 species worldwide. And the birds, it, the South American birds eat very differently than the Australian birds and the African birds. Do we, do we know of any of these uh, vegetables or herbs that are okay for some species, but not okay for other species? You know, that's a really great question. And, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, unfortunately, there really is not a, a lot of research at all right. um even honestly even to know what a lot of their normal diets are out in the wild you know it's surprising how little we actually know about what their na native diets are like we may know like okay they may forage from this particular tree or that particular tree at this time of year but we don't have the data on all the different species out there all the different things that they can eat we just have data on a few species um and and some very, very limited data on some others. Therefore, because we don't even have that, um, we have very, I, I mean, it's completely anecdotal evidence um, of what um, they can and can't eat, you know? So- But we always just make this assumption that if it's good for one pair, it's good for another, which may not be valid at all. Exactly. It may not be, it may not be, you know? And, um, we're constantly learning new stuff though. You know, we're constantly learning new things. So um, as more research happens over time, um, hopefully we can add more and more um, to our knowledge base and know what is appropriate to, to feed these guys. I mean, there's, there's several diseases that we work with now that, you know, a lot of veterinarians think, gosh, this has some sort of nutritional thing behind it, I'm sure, you know, and, and geez, maybe something that we talk about now that we say, oh, this is great for parrots. 
who knows, you know, five years from now, we could be saying, wait a second, we just learned that that's not the best thing to be doing. And you need to be feeding, you know, your cockatiel, this completely different thing versus what you feed your macaw, you know? Well, one, one place where I see that come up a lot is with fruit. Uh, you'll see a lot of the, uh, the seed mixes, the nutriberries, uh, treat sticks, all those things. Uh, frequently they put fruit in. And if you're an Australian bird, you just, most Australian birds don't eat fruit. That's just right. not part of their diet. So, um, you know, my cockatiel is like one, one cockatiel loves figs and another likes peaches, but in general, they don't eat fruit. And I wouldn't expect them to because that's not a natural part of an Australian, Australian diet. So right. then I'll see like, you know, Nutriberries for cockatiels and there'll be all this fruit. And I'm thinking, why are they doing that? That's just not something a cockatiel wants. Whereas right. a South American bird would, you know, that's that's a very major part of their diet. So, uh, you know, and we're just looking at broad areas, Australia versus South America. So you'd think they could, they could at least tease something like that out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I'll have a lot of um, clients who come in with cockatiels that say, oh my gosh, my cockatiel is so bad about eating fresh stuff. I just can't get them to it. And then I tell them, well, you know, in the wild, they're used to eating a lot of, they like dry grains. That's more what they're going to be eating. They're not really into the moist things. So fruits and, and vegetables, eh, you know, it's not uncommon to have a little difficulty. If you can get them to eat it, great, you know, fine, but don't stress yourself out if they're not into their fruit, you know, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> One thing they, they really do eat in the wild, and I, I have videos showing it uh, in Australia that they love fresh sprouts. So they do eat green sprouts. Uh, so trying to get your cocktail to eat greens. I mean, my, my cocktails, they've all always loved greens. They won't touch fruit, but fresh leafy greens like chard and um, lettuces or sprouts. Uh, yeah. I always recommend like a chia pet. They, I mean, they yeah. love chia pets, uh, wheat grass, just grow some wheat grass. It's very inexpensive. Because that's the kind of stuff they do eat in the wild. Right. Yeah. They're the, you know, we often uh, forget about those uh, little sprouts or little stemmy portions of a plant that they actually are consuming, you know, that that is a good part of their diet. Yeah. And we have a question here about how, how would you suggest introducing leafy greens to a cockatiel? Well, like, as you said, doing the sprouting, that's something that can be interesting and intriguing for them. Um, hanging it from cage or in a bowl. Um, you know, I, I guess I would probably experiment with a few different ways because it's also there's inter individual variability, you know, so where one bird may like something that hangs from the cage and they can kind of be more intrigued to go up to it and, and uh, nibble on it on the sides of the bars or like hanging down and like reaching up for it. Um, and other individual may want to have nothing to do with that because that's the scariest thing in the world and they prefer it in their food dish. So, so I would probably try it in a few different, different ways with them, but I honestly think the sprouting thing is, um, a nice way to get some birds really initially interested in greens if they've never been interested in them before. Um, and then like I was saying earlier too about sometimes misting the greens and getting the greens a little bit moist, um, having that little bit of moisture on them sometimes is intriguing as well because sometimes then it's like, oh, there's this weird little droplet of water on this thing and I'm gonna go investigate that and try that or rub my feathers up against it. And then while I'm really enjoying myself like taking this little bath, well, I'm gonna take a little nibble of the green. Oh, wait a second, that was delicious. I think I'm gonna take some more. So uh, just <laughs> different ways to, um, get them, get them intrigued. <laughs> yeah. So it always amazes me how fussy the birds in our home homes are and, uh, how they all have completely different inclinations towards things. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> They're all individuals, just like people. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Uh, do we have any other questions, either chat or, you know, you feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask a question. I was wondering, uh, is there any centralized avian databases? It sounds like everybody kind of is on their own and there's nothing centralized. Cent centralized for, for, for what do you mean? Well, like for, people, for instance, uh, the, all the questions about what foods are good for birds. Uh, it seems like everybody has their own list 
Uh, there's nothing centralized. Okay. I see what you mean. Yeah, I would say no, there is no like central data thing for birds. Um, you know, the thing that we try to, I guess, look for the most is sort of the, the, the most reliable data is going to be where there have been published scientific studies. So like for me as a veterinarian, I'm constantly looking for uh, journal articles that have gone into uh, different scientific journals that say um, this research has been done about this particular species um, and we know x y and z of what they eat. Um, that's where I try to get my data but honestly there's not a lot of that out there um, or as much as we would like really for all the different species that are kept in captivity um, or just that are parrots. Um, so, so no, there isn't any central thing. Um, so we often have to search around through different resources to find out what really is good information and, and has some data behind it to back it up. Hi, I have a question if... Okay. Uh... Hi, uh, my name's Lily, um, and I, uh, my partner Sam is around the corner, but um, uh, we, we have a question because we've got a cockatiel who's got like, um, his tummy's been feeling really bad, he's been water, like having really watery poops, and we've been going to the vet a lot to figure out what's wrong with him, and we still haven't been able to nail it down, so we were just, like, we've been laying off the greens for him just lately, because like we were worried, I don't know, that maybe we were irritating his, his tummy a little bit. So I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on like things to settle his, or like, I don't know, like safe things to settle his tummy a bit more. Well, so it's a, it's a good question. And it's, there's some, I can try to answer it very broadly because there's so many different things that could potentially be causing him to be a little bit irritated. And since I don't know all the different things that your veterinarian has done, um, First, I would say it's always nice to have a veterinary workup where an examination is done, but also looking at a poop sample, checking to make sure that the bacteria are normal, that there aren't any abnormal, um, abnormal bacteria, yeast organisms, parasitic organisms. Not that we see a lot of parasitic organisms in birds, but, but I will say um, the smaller birds are the ones that we see parasitic problems more commonly and cockatiels are one of the species that you can see parasites in with some frequency. Um, particularly these little single celled organisms or, um, or protozoal organisms, excuse me, um, that are called um, spironucleus are somewhat common in cockatiels. So that's something, if they hadn't checked for that, um, a good thing to be checking for. And there's different ways that you can check for it. You can just do um, fecal directs or you can do PCR uh, uh, tests to specifically look for that organism. And that's just for infectious diseases in the GI tract itself. There's lots of other things that can, can go wrong. It can make you have um, watery stools. So blood work is another thing that's nice to do. X-rays are a thing that's nice to do. There's toxins that can do it. So there's a whole laundry list of things that could potentially be um, contributing. So going through that and figuring out which one of those things it could be or checking those things off your list of, okay, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. Um, so there's that, but then the general question of, is there anything that you can do um, to potentially help settle their stomach? Two things, um, just broadly, again, without knowing exactly oh what's going on. Um, one is um, probiotics. Now probiotics in birds, in order for them to be truly effective, you have to have it from the same species. So what that means is if you have a cockatiel, you have to have probiotics made from a cockatiel. There are some broad probiotics out there that they, I'm not going to say that they don't work, but they are not as effective. They don't colonize the gut and have lasting effects the way probiotics will for made from the same species. Now, if you have a cockatiel, you are in luck because there are only three birds that um, they make species specific probiotic for, and that's budgies, cockatiels, and green cheek conures. That's it. Nobody else has probiotics made for them yet. Um, so if you have a cockatiel, you can um, order cockatiel specific probiotic and you can order it online. It's made by a veterinarian. So it's a, it's a good product. Um, and the way that they ship it to you is very, um, like you have to reconstitute it. It comes as a dry powder. You reconstitute it. You do it as a part of their water. So it's 
it's a, a pretty good product. If you search, the name of it is called Teal Back. Um, so like cockatiel, so teal back. Um, the, back. yeah, if you just do a Google search for teal back, it comes up very easily. Um, mm -hmm. The website I believe is called Avian Health Products. Um, and so you can order that. It's, an, it's something you can order. You don't need to have a prescription for it. Um, but I would talk to your veterinarian to make sure that they're okay with you doing that. So that's option one. Option two of something that you could potentially do for an upset stomach that is just sort of a um, general helpful thing for the GI tract, but I would definitely talk to your veterinarian, so it's specific for your bird before you do it, um, is um, bentonite clay. So the birds that are in South America that are going to those clay licks, um, and in the mornings they go out and they forage and they're like biting little pieces of clay off of those clay licks, what's in there is uh, bentonite clay. And it's still not 100% known exactly all the benefits of that, but we do know that it's beneficial for absorbing like toxins. Um, we do know it's beneficial for certain um, uh, micronutrients like your electrolytes, sodium, chloride, that sort of stuff. Um, so, and though that is sort of a South American bird thing, they're like, there's question of how helpful it is for other species as well. Like African greys, they found actually do eat some clay as well. Um, and these little ground foraging birds may also, as they are picking up stuff out of the ground, be getting some soil, also potentially be getting some dirt that has sort of similar benefits. Um, so they have done studies of bentonite clay in chickens and administering it to them and seeing how it affects their GI tract. Um, and it has been helpful for their GI tract, um, making it so that they have more favorable gut organisms and less of the sort of non-favorable gut organisms. So those are just two broad things I can tell you as possible beneficial things to do for your bird that are um, safe, but definitely talk to your veterinarian, particularly about the bentonite clay one, just because yeah. we want to know that it's really appropriate for your bird as an individual. So. Oh. Right. And I'm so sorry, just because um, you answered these questions so well, but we were having an internet issue at the very beginning. So when you're talking about the test, sorry, I think yeah. you're like, so you said like, so we've done all these fecal exams and so then you were like blood tests and things too. And then I think that's all I heard. Maybe yeah. Protozoa, they, they checked, he's been checked out for uh, protists and things. And then it seemed like he has like, outsize amount of gram negative bacteria in his in his poops so okay. we, we're giving him antibiotics right now but this is like the third round of this and it's still okay like yeah. so, so if you have a bird who like repeatedly has gram negative bacterial infections there's a there always has to be a question well why is this a repeat problem because maybe a one soft gram negative infection here or there like okay you know it can happen but if you repeatedly have these infections then Sometimes making it so his gut health isn't as ideal as it should be. And so if you've already done the fecal things, then blood work would be another thing that's good to do. X-rays, toxin testing, honestly. Toxin testing, I, it's something that we always think like, oh, my bird would never get into some sort of toxin. And I, I have to say like 90% of the time that I diagnose birds with toxin exposure, the owners have no clue where it came from. So it's always good to check for it and make sure that it's not something that's a contributing factor. Um, but then it also goes back to if your bird's chronic problem always is that you have this gram negative flora, then maybe getting him some good gut flora is also gonna be really beneficial for him. Okay. So Benibac is not terribly useful then because they usually give me Benibac to give birds when I have them on antibiotics. Yeah, so you know, for a while there, Benibac was all that we had available to us. Um, and I think it's helpful to some degree in that it probably, while they are taking it, has some benefits for altering the pH, but it doesn't colonize the gut. So it's not gonna have a lasting effect while they're on it. So it probably helps just in the time where they're getting it, but then beyond that, it's not gonna be helpful. Versus the teal back, that stuff actually colonizes the gut. It actually stays there so that you have a more lasting benefit in the long run. That's, That's really great to know. I, I wasn't aware yeah. they had specific ones. And uh, that honestly just became available probably like in the last three years, I want to say, is when mm -hmm. that became available. So someone finally did some research <laughs> on those three fantastic. species. I, I actually wrote that down and I'll, I'll send that out to everybody uh, for information so you'll all have that. 
uh, you talk about the um, the bentonite also. So, I mean, I have mineral blocks, cuddle bones and all that, but they also sell these blocks. Of, they're called Manu mud blocks. You can get them in any bird store or online and they make it look like, you know, clay lick mud. But that's, I think, does have bentonite in it and they specifically do that. So I actually have that in, in every cage. I don't know if anybody's actually eating it, but um, at least there there is an awareness about the the bentonite, and uh, you can you can pick up that up anywhere. Um, I guess if you want to really make sure they get it, maybe you'd sprinkle it on food or something. But yeah, exactly. If you're going to use it more as that like sort of therapeutic, um, if you're having a problem, then yeah, sprinkling on some food is is simple. That that's great. And I wasn't aware that um, it was okay still for Australian birds too, because again, you know, I know the South American birds in the uh, the African birds consume it, but but you're right. You know, when I watched cockatiels in Australia, uh, uh, cockatiels and cockatoos grazing everywhere, and they're eating the little shoots and the seeds. And you're right; they're always picking up dirt in their mouths. So they probably are getting all that natural bird. Whereas the arboreal birds, the birds in the trees in South America, have to specifically go to clay licks to get it because they're not ground feeding and and eating dirt. Yeah. Um, I just see a question came up of, can you repeat the last product name? So it's bentonite clay. And actually I'll type it down here in the chat. Uh, bentonite. Okay, there we go. So everyone can see the actual name of it. And that, you know, that's, that's a really good point, Lily and Sam, because your bird's been on multiple courses of antibiotics. So he probably has no normal flora, just like us. You know, as humans, when we go on antibiotics, if you take a course or two of antibiotics, you're literally wiping out all your natural flora. That's why a lot of times they'll encourage you to eat yogurt or things like that, because when you wipe out everything normal, that gives you more opportunity if you're having problems with, with abnormal bacteria coming in to recolonize you. So that is something that we have to do have to think about with our birds. Yeah, and it's great to know about the species specific stuff because we've had our guys on fauna flora for, we're in Canada, so I don't know if there's oh, okay. like brands, but we've had them on fauna flora for, for a while. So, but I will look into teal back. So thanks so much for that. We're really appreciative. Yeah. Yeah. And I do want to remind everybody that this is being recorded, so it will be posted. You can go back and listen to portions again if, if you miss something. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, I just want to Thank everybody for coming. I want to really thank Dr. Nam for giving this talk to us. I, I, this is fantastic. It's such exciting, useful information. I hope everyone got a lot about a lot out of it. And um, uh, just want to thank everyone for coming. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Let me see.